started recording now. So we will start the summit. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth Open Air Asia Summit. So my name is Xu Dong Lui and the professor from Zhejiang University in China. I will host this summit today. And uh, since the coronavirus is still raging worldwide, this time still have to hold this summit online. It's a, it's a pity. I can still remember we have extraordinary meeting in Japan for the first summit and in China for the second summit. I, I hope in next year, the fifth Asia summit will be held offline so we can meet face to face. In this summit, we, where we will have six very interesting talks from open air experts in different countries. Each will have 20 minutes for speech and five minutes for question and answers. So the, uh, for the audience, so if you have questions, you can type in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the messaging windows when the, the, the speakers are talking and also you can, you can uh, ask the questions in the five minutes. And for all the uh, summit, we will, re re we will have a recording and the recording files will be distributed on the YouTube after the meeting so more people can see the, the all the summit results. So now the, I will introduce the first speaker, Dr. Heather Leslie. She is currently the head of Open Air Modeling Program. She has a leading many modeling projects worldwide and uh, is also the administrator of CKM. He, she, she, her talk will cover the state of CKM at the present, plus some practical insights into modeling data sets, including the IPS and the COVID. So has the please start to you uh, talk. Thank you, Zidong. Good morning, everybody. I'm dialing in from Melbourne in Australia. Um, and as Zidong said, um, I'm the clinical program lead for Open Air International. And I'm really not a technician. I'm a primary care clinician and I've um, been working as a health informatician now for a number of years. And I wanted to be able to talk to you a little bit about what's happening, I guess, in the real world. We often talk about the ideal world of open air and I'm assuming people have a basic understanding of open air and modeling. So that's the working assumption. Um, and I wanted to really just, just, I guess, speak to some of the things that are on my mind at the moment. So my presentation is really gonna be warts and all. It's, it's about where we are now and some of my concerns as much as um, some of the, the things that I think we're achieving really well. So I just Googled some of these pictures around data value. Um, they're just quite random. Um, really, but I think, you know, what we all agree is that health data is enormously valuable um, and we can't underestimate the impact that it can have on healthcare delivery. But in all of these documents that are shared on the web about around health data or data value itself, no one tends to talk about design and no one tends to talk about coherent ecosystems. It's like it already exists and how can we use it? And there's not a lot of thought given to how we actually um, utilize this best or, or put it in the best position, I guess, for um, how we can optimize it. So let's go to the next slide. This is something else that I wanna bring into this talk in that this is on my mind quite a lot. We are, every time we record health data that is not well designed or we don't fully understand what it means, we're creating technical debt. We're creating problems with the data for future use. And I think we have an enormous responsibility um, to be trying to work out how to do this smarter and better. And I think open air is part of that solution. It's not the only thing, but I think every time we create one little bit of data, it's just adding to the potential problem of technical debt if it's created in silos or in projects um, that are totally isolated from others. So I just want to have you know, have that in the back of your mind. I also am battling with this notion of a universal health language or a lingua franca for health. Um, to me, this is a foundation that we need. Um, and some people talk about 
um, the notion of the the um, the Tower of Babel, which is a I think primarily a biblical story, but I think it there are also equivalent stories in many different cultures and backgrounds. And I always thought that the Tower of Babel was actually about creating a single language. But when I actually looked at it the other day, it's actually where we all had a single language and God had a reason to actually um, fragment the languages because of the arrogance of um, the humans on earth. And I, that turned my whole thinking around, which was quite interesting because we've never done anything like a universal health language before. Is it actually feasible? And this was my word of the week, hubris. So are we being overconfident and excessively arrogant to think that we can do this? We need to make it multilingual. We need to make it culturally appropriate. We need to look at the whole size and scope, which is, you know, breadth, depth, depth, dynamic nature, how health is changing, the whole scale across healthcare registries and so on. It's massive. So are we really daring to do this? And I, I think we are. And I think, you know, I've been doing this work now for over 10 years, and I think we've got a long way to go, but we've actually made some very good inroads. Um, so even if we can't achieve it fully, I think we need to kind of see that we've created some value in trying to standardise the atomic health data. If we look at that health design, health data design, the traditional way has been typically reactive. Um, it's in, been in response to a particular project or a particular task or a particular form. Um, and I would suggest that people do their best to create good data sets, but it's based on what they know and what's available to them. And there's usually not a lot of scientific rigor to that data design. And I guess that's the question of what does scientific rigor in this kind of area entail? And I'm not sure we have the answer to that yet, to be honest. But often it's about this was sensible at the time and with what we knew and the resources at hand, et cetera. So we, we talked to one or two clinicians, we looked at what was on the forms or we looked at what was on um, existing screens. And so this is the kind of approach that I feel like fire is taking and it concerns me in that it's about the legacy data. So if our legacy data is created with that kind of traditional philosophy in mind, any errors or issues in that legacy data is really being amplified by fire because it's being reused and it will continue to be reused into the future. And I see there's quite a difference there in the philosophy with open air because the open air intent is to be quite different in that we are trying to achieve a balance between what we think is best practice, practice and legacy <sighs> data. So we're trying to manage what is pre-existing. There's no doubt we have to do that, but we also have to try and give some kind of roadmap of what the data should look like. And then I guess the question is who is authorized or capable of actually saying what that looks like? And maybe that's our hubris. Maybe that's our, you know, our arrogance that we think in open air that we can do that. But it's certainly what we're attempting to do in the best possible way. We're also trying to create this coherent data system. So we actually have an ecosystem that works together. And are we trying to, are we using scientific rigor? And that's a really good question. Um, I do see that a lot of the things that underpin open air are giving us some rigor that is not present in other approaches. And I particularly want to emphasize the classes that I've bolded there. I think from a modeling point of view, that is pretty spectacular. And I see that that actually helps us to achieve an enormous amount in describing data accurately. For example, with medications, we actually have medications that can be represented as observations, as evaluations, as orders, and as actions. So all of the four main clinical classes, we have ways of needing to represent data that represent the point in time observation, an overall summary as an evaluation, and of course, our orders and actions recording what needs to be done and how it's being done. So I think that's not unique, not for just medications, but I think that's poorly understood when we're looking at data design in other paradigms with other philosophies. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm giving us a tick for the intent, at least. Um, someone else can judge or evaluate how much we're actually achieving, but it's certainly what underpins everything that we're doing. Um, if we look at the traditional data set development, it tends to be, let's gather all the information, put it in a bucket, mix it up, 
Now, I know that's quite simplistic, but it is a sense of that. We do a whole lot of reviews and we you know, send things, spreadsheets out, things like that. And we come up with a single artifact that might be a, um, a document or a, a message. Um, we're creating effectively a minimum data set because everyone has to fight about what goes in there. And ultimately what happens over a period of months to years is that everyone loses to some degree because no one can have what their ideal data is. That's the whole notion that, that underpins a minimum data set. It's what is the bare minimum that we can actually agree. And that's basically the way we, we tend to have done that for a long, long time. And that's the way a lot of people are still designing data sets. The open air side of things is where we have this secret source, I'm gonna call it, um, which is the archetypes, which is this, this um, body of pre-qualified, clinically verified and maximal um, fragments of, of data design for each one for each particular concept. But I think that's the key here. We have these building blocks. And so when we design something, we have a whole lot of input that comes into this tool that we've got called the Clinical Knowledge Manager, which is our library of, of archetypes. And we do central reviews and we have uh, distributed reviews that happen in that kind of concept and we publish our archetypes. So that development of archetypes happens independent of any particular context or document. And we build them over a period of months to years and we get a whole lot of rigor around it. And then what we can do is to create a whole lot of different data sets that come out of that building blocks. So this can take days to weeks in effect. And what we end up with, and you can see there's a whole range of, of different documents that came out of some of the COVID work that we did. They're actually, because I've got the underlying archetypes in common, there's a whole lot of commonality between those data sets as well. And what we end up then is coherent data sets as well as the coherent building blocks of archetypes. So if we step into the real world now of what is happening in our clinical knowledge render, I'm talking about the international one of which I'm an administrator. And we've currently got over two and a half thousand people from 101 countries who are involved. So the most people in fact are coming from Brazil, um, from UK and interestingly, interestingly from the US at the moment. So they're the top three in terms of numbers of registered users. Uh, as far as the archetypes are concerned, um, I took these stats this morning from the CKM. Um, in actual fact, while there's 999 archetypes, um, 500, about 550 are active and currently in governed projects. So there's a whole lot of ones that are in uh, what we call incubators, which are like the, the sand pits where people are just devising new ones, starting to collaborate and so on. And of those 122 are published and 15 are currently in review. We've got a new report on CKM that's just come out recently and it's actually showing the data types that are being used in the archetypes. Um, and you can see down the bottom here that text and coded text with value sets are um, the most common ones with ordinals and quantities um, following fair way behind. And the total of that is we've got over 5,000 data points and an average of about nine and a quarter data points for each archetype. So that's, that's the kind of state we're in. Um, we have 30 languages represented. Um, so there's currently, if you look at this problem diagnosis archetype that I've represented as a mind map, they've got 36 Italian translations. We've got 268 Norwegian ones, and we've got 15 Chinese ones in the CKM, but we also know the Chinese collaboration has their own repository and they have over 400 archetypes in that. Uh, and we may hear more about that, I anticipate later. I wanted to flag one particular bit of activity that we've done lately, and that is we've got a new archetype. It's an evaluation and it's about advanced intervention decisions. And it's meant to be the clinician's um, equivalent to a, a patient's advanced care directive. So this has been quite a, an interesting block of work in that most data sets, if we're talking around this kind of thing, they tend to talk about what is the CPR decision. Are they for resuscitation, not for resuscitation, et cetera? And that's really the extent of it. But what we've tried to do here is to actually create an archetype that looks at all of the kinds of decisions at related to saving or prolonging life. So not something that's meant to be decided reactively when in a patient arrests, but something that goes into a health record to say, if they arrest, you're allowed to do these things. You can intubate them, you can do full CPR, or not, and all of the range of interventions that might be appropriate, including transfer to intensive care or not, those kinds of choices. So we actually have an opportunity now to document it in a standardized way, but 
we cannot find any serious um, modeling out there that's been done that actually represents this. This really is a world first as far as we're aware. Um, and it was not without its difficulties. It only went through four review rounds, but there was a huge amount of participation and a huge amount of conflicting feedback that we had to try to filter through. And it started off being called limitation of treatment, but they've been called ceilings of treatment and finally advanced interventions decisions. Um, there were 88 reviews done in the international space and in the parallel reviews in Norway. We had 49 people participate from 14 countries and we have now that same archetype is published in the open air international CKM and in the Norwegian CKM. So they're exactly the same, but they're being published in um, different jurisdictions. The Norwegian one is obviously being used in Norwegian language. So that's the kind of ideal, you know, if we all play together, we can create this, what appears like a, a you know, the real possibility of, of getting to a lingua franca. But this is where choices come into the, the picture and this is where things can go wrong. And they can go wrong at a number of levels. And I was going to speak to this just quickly about we can, they can go wrong at the whole CKM level. So at national or regional or organisational level, at a project level. So that's the equivalent of choices about templates and about how we design archetypes. And then, of course, terminology and all sorts of other things come into it as well. So we can create you know, what might be a perfect international CKM as a source of truth, but there's a lot of other places where choices might mean we get divergence and deviation. So this is going back to that original picture that we had of this is, might be what we consider an ideal CKM. Um, if we have two jurisdictions, A and B, and they take the green, you know, those green arrows are taking archetypes from that CKM um, and start to use it. They've also got inputs coming through that red arrow, if you like, local requirements, quite valid requirements. And how do they manage that and try to keep things, you know, how do they balance trying to keep things consistent, but also enable for local requirements, local um, jurisdictional legal requirements and so on, in just plain clinical cultural differences. So this is always going to be a tension. And there is a real potential that we could end up with divergence. So despite starting with the same archetypes, we can end up with different outputs. Um, and then I guess, is that really a source of truth? And that's, that's a choice about how you approach things. The other side is you can take the, that same kind of thing and you really regard it as a, a solid source of truth. And we go through the same kind of thing with two different jurisdictions. But if you make choices to actually converge the data, that if we've got new requirements, we actually bring it back to grow that pile of archetypes. For example, Norway. So we work very closely with Norway, hand in hand, essentially, so that they actually feed back any of their requirements back into that international um, scenario so that we can keep that very closely aligned. So that's, again, a choice that the Norwegian jurisdiction has made to do. Um, at project level and at template level, this is looking at um, the COVID work that we did um, last year. So there was some very quick work done within Norway. So some very quick modelling that was then implemented with about 10 days of people realising that this was an issue. And other work then followed through uh, fast followers that were you know, published within a couple of months. But this table is showing an analysis I did on some of the work that we put into CKM. So down this left-hand side of the archetypes, all the different types of archetypes. Um, and across here, we've got some incubators. So these are the I guess the raw um, low govern governance, I guess, around a template. So these are uh, data sets for a screening assessment and infection report and a nephrology report. Here are some other data sets, but they've been put into a project because they're using more governed archetypes. So there's two different flavors, I guess, in this big column here and this other one that I want to emphasize. Below this line here are some ungoverned archetypes. So we've got some around symptom signs, outbreak exposure, travel trip history, and so on. So we're using a symbol for a ninja here because they're done quick, they're done very nimbly, um, but sometimes it's not done with a whole lot of sort of rigor behind it. And then we've got others that I'm representing as a samurai. So these are the good solid archetypes that we think are potentially going to be used into the future that have got a lot more thinking behind it, looking at the patterns, looking at um, the rationale for how we've actually designed it. And I wanted to show you that the, each of these templates here I'm representing as a, a little helicopter. So it's taking one building block of an archetype 
as one you know, Lego block, building them into something that's more complex. So a template comprises you know, maybe 30, 40, 60 archetypes potentially. So we're gonna represent that as a little helicopter. Um, the purple one is that's created by a, a slightly different organization, but used a lot of the same kind of archetypes. And then in the projects, we use some more robust ones. So we've got more robust templates, if you like. And so if we analyze it and we look at in these incubators, we're actually using a lot more of the ungoverned archetypes. And in the projects, we're only using one, which only gives us 3%. So that's the big difference. We, we're really not using any of those ones that haven't had a lot of rigor. So these ones, to be fair, were developed within days. They were reactive to the problem. So we, we were trying to react to, to give um, COVID data sets in a timely manner. So that's to be fair. But with a little bit more time, we were able to create better models. And so we've been able to shift those ones down here up into this square up here. So for the, the uh, templates that were built that are in this um, project space, a lot of them are now a lot more robust and probably going to be used into the future. We've used them since in other data sets as well for other purposes. I wrote a paper around this and I've got the reference there. And this is another representation, the same kind of thing we've just seen, but it's the analysis really across all of them that's important. And I wanna show you, especially that for those first two or three templates, there were low levels of reuse. Whereas in the subsequent ones that were in the project area, in fact, they're up almost 100% for most of them, one at 80%. So that's a really good news story in that we've, we've had a process where we can take the very quickly developed archetypes and develop them further into ones that can be used for other purposes and across the same purpose here in slightly different, um, different representations. But I'm also gonna flag the 55% and the 52%, those templates are in real life implementations. And so effectively they are sitting in, in collecting data every day. And my concern is that they are effectively outliers to what the other data might be. So it is a kind of technical debt, if you like. And we have to think about that and be mindful of that. I think in the context and the circumstances, this is not unreasonable, but this is not a philosophy that we really want to perpetuate into the future. If we have time, we should really be focusing on trying to develop them in this way that we can create archetypes that create this kind of level of reuse. At the archetype level, I also just wanted to give you a, a quick example that um, in one area, we've seen somebody looking at activities of daily living in aged care. And so they've developed seven observation archetypes, one for dressing, drinking, eating, grooming, et cetera. Well, the alternative is to identify that underlying pattern and to actually say, we're gonna describe any self care activity on a, on a daily basis by a, um, a person in an aged care home, for example. And we're gonna say, well, this is the activity name. So all of those seven observations are represented here but within one archetype and a pattern that's actually reusable in these different contexts. So again, these are choices about how we go about modeling for being reactive to what might be in a particular form or trying to look at the underlying pattern that might then apply to any other activity as well. So it might be other things outside of those seven and we don't have to end up with potentially 20. We could actually have one archetype that has 20 values as the activity name. So again, choices. Um, the other thing, it's just my final slide. I just wanted to give you a sense of a project that's happening in Australia at the moment. It's been happening in a, over two years in two phases and it's been very open. It's been very transparent and wiki based and that is not normal for Australia. So it's been a very welcome and refreshing approach. Um, what we've done is we've used open air archetypes as the foundation, although we're slowly letting people know that's the case, but the, the CSIRO, who's the organisation who's been running it, were very much aware that what we had as a starting point was really important. And the notion of giving the clinicians a subset of archetypes that are equivalent to a template, but that's what we revealed to them and never agreed that this is their data set that they want to use. Uh, we know that we've got a maximum data set sitting behind them. So we know that's our potential roadmap. So if we've only got two or three data elements out of an archetype in our current straw man, we know that if there's 10 or 20 uh, data elements in that archetype, we can gradually reveal them in a coherent way over time as we want more data, data and detail. And the clinicians love this. The clinicians feel really engaged. They are basically going, yes, agree, agree, agree. So they're not 
finding any things that we're missing in those archetypes, but they're actually you know, not getting engaged in really basic discussions around what it should be that often get um, very difficult. So it's been a great process of clinician engagement. Now, the documentation is using a biological modeling tool. An output is a Word document to give to our government um, funders. And we also need a CKM because clearly there's not a lot of governance happening here. And output is actually FHIR. So we're using open air to enable FHIR. So Australia is very much focused on FHIR as the way for implementation between sharing any messages, et cetera, between any of the clinical systems. They don't want to adopt open air but they're certainly finding that the value of the open air archetypes is absolutely feeding and driving this. So it's kind of like the best kept secret at the moment. Um, while this is primary care, um, we're about to start a third phase. We think we've got funding that's just about to be signed off um, and it will be focused on indigenous health assessments um, and also quite a lot of work around aged care. Um, so there's my contact details. If anyone wants to find out any more, we'll make these slides available. Um, thank you very much for listening. A very quick overview. See you, Dong. Okay. Uh, thank you, Heather, for very, very good presentation. So is there any questions about uh, uh, to, to Heather? So we still, uh, we can have several minutes for the questions and answers. And I have one question. So during my work about modeling using open air, so uh, from my knowledge, so currently the, all the archetypes uh, is uh, around the, uh, the, the recording the, the, the data during the, uh, during the practice, like uh, you recording the medication or just now you have take the example of the acti activity of daily lives. But uh, we have uh, we have lots of uh, I have met lots of projects around the like cohort study uh, where the, 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 the clinical research researchers need to record uh, the 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 uh, uh, some variables are uh, maybe used for the research purposes so. Uh, so the, the problem is how to integrate all the data collected in the different code studies. Uh, so when we model in the, this status, so those data are not, they come from the uh, directly clinical practice, but uh, they are not the same as the clinical practice. They need a new organization of all the data structures. Uh, but as the, in the CKM country, there are no much archetypes uh, focused on this for, for this purpose so is there any plan for ckm to content to to to, to develop uh, such kind of the archetypes for especially for the research it's a really good question jidong and and that's why i guess i i raised the question if is a single health language feasible um are we trying to do too much and i think the answer is still um, we don't know yet. So you're absolutely right that the archetypes have been focused mainly on direct clinical care. Some of the COVID work um, was also reflecting slightly different purposes. And um, we, in fact, developed a whole family of archetypes around questionnaires that would suit registries or pot potentially um, research data collections and things like that. But it was the first experience we've had of doing that. And we've developed some patterns that underpin some of that. Um, I think there's a few people who are starting to talk about how might we work with OMOP and some other research languages. And I think we need to start to explore that for sure. And I think what we'll see is there may well be clinical data at the foundation. And then it would be sensible if we could then have a coherent way of being able to derive the registry or research level data from the the raw clinical data as much as possible. So there is a relationship between them. We don't develop them just de novo and with no connected basis, if you like. And I think that's something we still have to explore. Is there a strategy? No, because we haven't got, um, we haven't got funding and resources and so on enough to be able to do that. But should we find partners? 
or projects, I think that would be a, a perfect thing to start to extend the work that we're doing. I'm certainly very open to it. I would be very excited by that. Uh, will we be successful? I don't know, but we've got to give it a try. And then we, we may have to um, redefine what the scope of that health language is or what is achievable by open air, or maybe we can actually embrace all of these things and we can actually bring a whole lot of this stuff together. So we're converging the research world with the clinical world. I mean, that would be my ideal, but um, that's the future and I can't answer that yet. Love to explore it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I, I'm also very interested in to explore it together because that sounds we, good. Are now, we are now looking at the as a standards like a CDISC or, or like a CD, they are more focused on research purposes. Maybe we can have some linkage with these standards. So we I can think so. It. I think so. I welcome it. Okay, so thank you. So the, the so we will move to the second speech. It's by Dr. Shinji Kobayashi. Uh, Dr. Kobayashi. <coughs> is the head of the Open AI localization program, also the Open AI Japan ambassador. In this, in his presentation, he will talk about the features of ICO data and how they are standardizing with Open AI technology. Research is very useful to integrate ICO data so as to improve the efficiency of diagnostic therapeutic approach and predict pro, uh, prognosis by medicine learning AI technologies. So please, Shinji Kobayashi, so you, I, I will switch the code for you. Okay. Yes. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, for introduction of, of me. Uh, I, I talk about IC data standardization with open data models and techniques. So, oh, oh. Ah, okay. Uh, this is the agenda, the back, out, out of background, data overview, and terminology, and modules, templates, and archetypes. So, ICU is an abbreviation of intensive care unit. Uh, uh, ICU is newly ap appeared in a long, a relatively new section in hospitals um, that is uh, because uh, medicine has advanced more uh, intensive care is required for such demands uh, see, uh, I, I see you in ICU uh, trained experts doctors and nurses uh, manages a severe condition a patient in severe conditions such as perioperative, perioperative care, uh, continuous needs continuous modeling, uh, severe case in wards and other departments, emergency, emergency such as traffic accident, uh, brain stroke, or acute coronary syndrome with advanced devices and tech, apparatus technology. However, uh, all over the world, ICU capacity is not enough for demands uh, because uh, uh, ICU, uh, ICU doctors and nurses uh, need a long time training period. Uh, it can it cannot do uh, uh, increase rapidly on demand. So our motivation to integrate ICU data is one, one is a tele-ICU. To integrate data for experts, we can, we can consult and service uh, many patients inter, uh, beyond, the, uh, border, border, beyond, beyond the border of hospitals and ICUs. So tele-ICU and uh, another another uh, interest with AI machine learning, uh, early detection of risk or a prognosis is very, and making uh, early alert 
for doctors are very useful. There are the many, many data, huge of data. So some of them are uh, ignored and getting some errors and mistakes. Uh, these are the information in ICU I listed. So history, parentalness, observations, vital signs uh, taken uh, frequently. Uh, in other uh, in other words, was uh, internal medicine or surgery, uh, vital signs are taken in twice or per, twice or three times in a day. But in ICU, uh, five minutes each, one minute each, or uh, thirty seconds each is very usual in ICU. Lab tests, uh, lab tests, imaging pathology, pathology is a frequently taken and blood bars and very uh, another uh, interesting matter and diagnosis, severity assessment and evaluation is uh, needs a frequently and changes cha depends on such evaluation, is a uh, medication and procedure uh, on timely changes. Or more frequent, uh, yes, it is also more frequently than the other ones. Uh, new apparatus, ex extracorporeal circulation, uh, CHDFP, IABP, ECMO, you know, um, very great weapon in ICU. And administration information in ICU matters. Uh, feature of ICU data is to cover all clinical domains, all items in clinical domain in general. Uh, all, because all the, all the patients have the risk to get into ICU, so many, uh, many uh, patients of, of many uh, various backgrounds uh, admit in ICU, so and data uh, collected from various services, uh, sensors, monitors, uh, ventilator, uh, ECMO, or other new apparatus. So there's many data and many many devices, many data. Uh, and target might be beyond existing standards is an, uh, is the the problem. I mention this later, but uh, ECMO, IABP, uh, we can uh, I cannot find any good enough standards for the, for this newcomers. Uh, this is a data flow in ICU. Uh, patient uh, data, vital observation data, vital signs, uh, vital signs, uh, vital signs, uh, lab data is corrected with uh, corrected by uh, sensor and um, devices, including nurses or, or physicians, nurses and physicians, are uh, displayed in ICU service dashboard. And other in, uh, and other therapy, uh, other settings and instructions are also displayed in ICU service system dashboard. So the first target is ICU uh, to get correct capture data from ICU service system. Uh, to standardize ICU data is another is a first of cases uh, analyze uh, analyze. Uh, existing data standards or new, we need to develop new new one and make a mind map and terminology research on my terminology and models and mind map for uh, to make up a, make up a brain to capture 
to know such a data, ICU data. Uh, and we tried sample data collection from uh, uh, two ICUs and checked terminology coverage and the data modeling, modeling co coverage. Uh, but the data from ICU is not well stand, not good enough to standardize. Uh, this is one table, one table, CSV table in from ICU dashboard. Uh, the first column is date time, second column is item name, and value was mixed with text and number. And, and some of them are did GCS pupils right reflex uh, cohesion, cohesion uh, makes a data cohesion uh, with uh, separators uh, to normalize uh, to normalize and standardize such uh, data is a uh, hard way and changing data structure for this is uh, costs very high in some cases. Uh, this is another problem. Uh, this, uh, uh, this was from another ICU dashboard monitor, monitoring for IABP and CFDF. The first come, uh, do, that has uh, two more than two hundred columns in in two hundred columns in single line. Uh, first column is date time. Uh, second to about hundred is IABP data uh, columns. Some are, some of them are filled, and not uh, all of them are not filled. Not uh, some of them are not filled. Uh, orange. Uh, from 100 to 200 is CHDF data. Some of them are filled and others are not filled. We have to extract and capture IABP data and CHDF for, from this dashboard data. Uh, so item names are so has a variation in ICU uh, because their uh, vendors are different and even same vendors, post, uh, terminology or terms, item names are different in hospital to hospital. Uh, so I see you as, uh, I tried with, I tried to map with uh, Japan ICU societies terminology, but that not that doesn't cover as well. So uh, now I am trying to use link to binding uh, make a terminology binding and mapping. Uh, this is also a terminology binding for body temperature. Uh, some some of them are too much and. Some of them are partially much. Uh, Roger, you are right. That is real world data. Uh, so um, to change, remove, uh, <laughs> remove such as um, cosmetics is very difficult. But we need to uh, get close to for health IT side and healthcare data side. Uh, current strategy is uh, cap capture me uh, CSV and some of them are HL7 2.0, 2.x file to normalize terminology mapped as uh, CSV or other and get into 
template and archetype in uh, EHRBS Open EHRS standards. Uh, terminology, various model, there may, I, I've read some discussion about terminology and taxonomy with modern, um, modern. Both have the merit, uh, there are many pros, pro, con, uh, merit and demerits. Uh, so left side, terminology based table looks simple, but uh, query all the body temperature or core temperature is uh, such a flexible query is difficult. Light one model basis looks a little uh, looks a little complex. Two more comes, but query all the body temperature with some location uh, is easier. There are many pro pro con uh, pro con uh, modern this uh, ID spread here. But you, we can choice which is better in your cases. So I cho choice the terminology, uh, th terminology mapping at first and model to the second for secondary use. Uh, so data for machine, machine learning, uh, statistics, uh, uh, tele ICU to conversation. Uh, this is my map in, for ECMO by Dr. Takagi, Yokohama, uh, Yokohama City University. Uh, very complex items for at this time. And made a template and architects, vital sign, blood gas, in out balance. They are very easy to construct, but ventilator, ECMO, IABP, or others, very deep. Uh, we are serving here. Current problem is dialysis, uh, vascular access in out, blood balance, blood procedure type. These words are not, uh, we can, I can't find these terms in even in Sonoma City or like ECMO IVP. I cannot find any available standards uh, or summary. ICU data contains various data with few standards. Uh, Tamil is covered well in vital sign lab data, ventilator settings, and observations in LOINC. ISO 19 to 3, uh, very good for ventilator settings and vital signs. Uh, open it the models covers well in vital sign, lab data, and respiratory. Uh, uh, now in venture, uh, we are talking, uh, discussing with header three with ventilation. But some new for new approaches. We need to develop more from. So my last message is uh, stay home and make Akitepna meet up in the next year in Kyoto. <laughs> Maybe so. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. She Any questions? Memorize the, for the, for the photo. <laughs> Okay, so is there any questions for, for, for Shinji's presentation? Yeah. Check. Hi, Cindy. I, I have a question. Uh, it's a very interesting research. Uh, as we know, the ICU data uh, has the feature uh, that the data is a continued, uh, uh, continu uh, uh, it is a uh, sequence data ah. uh, continue okay. yeah yeah uh, uh, how can we uh, present the continu continuous uh, sequence data in an efficient way 
in uh, OpenShar archetype. Uh, have you a uh, continuous, uh, continuous monitored? Uh, mm. uh, so the data is sequence data. Uh. Oh, yeah. Time sequence, yeah. Yes, uh, time sequence data. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Now the archetype uh, uh, mostly um, is presented uh, not for mm -hmm. the sequence data uh, or not mm -hmm. uh, present the sequence data very well. Have you any question, uh, uh, recommendations? So, uh, yes, uh, making a template for to express such a sequence is one idea. And, uh, but current data situation is, <laughs> is, more primitive one, only timeline, only timeline and item name and uh, values. So to record sequence, sequential or to sequential such as a uh, 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 glucose tolerance test or some uh, some events we should be uh, should we make a template capture such a uh, data sequence in uh, in a PO, but uh, just a timeline such as a, a date time and observation might be a uh, only observation would be enough to express because enough to express this. Uh, so uh, I'm so uh, I'm I'm just ashamed that uh, ICU data in my country is not so good, but just as time sequential data by observation active is enough for this in the country's situation. Thank you. Okay, so, you. so I noticed that Sherry have the question in the messaging box. So which data, uh, uh -huh. also about the time series data. So she asks uh -huh. which, uh, which data type is used for recording time series uh -huh. data. So, uh, yeah, which uh, data is the reference model? Uh, uh, so, oh, uh, event observation, uh, there is an event model in observation archetype uh, that, that can record uh, the time zero to five minutes later, 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later in such, in sequences, in some uh, tolerance or exercise, exertion test. But the uh, ICU data is uh, only a time, current ICU data is only current uh, time sequential, blood uh, pressure, heart rate, and body temperature in five, every five minutes. Okay. 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 So I, I have a very, very simple question for Shinji. So I noticed that uh, you you have developed the new archetypes in in for for some certain uh, types of data in ICU. Uh, so is this archetypes shareable to public or, or your of health course. friend? Uh, uh, so yeah. it has some linkage for us because we are also involved. I'm also involved in one ICU project and uh, it will be very, oh, oh, very good. good if you can share that. Okay. 
So, so maybe we can talk to you later. So, uh, okay. uh, thank you, Shinji, for the very good presentation and also the answering the questions. So next, uh, we, we move to the third speech uh, by uh, Professor Dong Seng Zhao. Uh, uh, Professor Zhao is a research fellow of Academy of Military Science China. He has also led the projects of China Military Electronic Health Record and the China Stroke Prevention Project both using OpenAI as the infrastructure of system. So this time, he will talk about their experience to standardize the stroke screening and EMR data with OpenAI in China Stroke Prevention Project. The purpose is to integrate and share such data to improve the efficiency of diagnostic treatment and recovery. So, uh, and uh, Professor Zhao, please start your uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, is uh, thank you for Professor Lu gave me uh, the opportunity to share experience uh, and, and uh, to uh, learn more the experience from others. Uh, uh, my today I will talk about uh, the uh, stroke uh, data standardization with open share models. Uh, our our practice in China stroke prevention project. Uh, this is my agenda. Uh, and we know uh, stroke is the leading cause of death in China. It has the features of characters of high mobility, high recurrence, and high disability, and high mortality. Uh, in 2009, uh, China have launched a program named the Stroke Prevention Project by the Minister of uh, Health. The aim of CISPP is to pro pro probe new ways for chronic disease prevention, uh, as promoting the networking of stroke uh, prevention and upgrading the medical treatment level for cerebral vascular diseases. Uh, for this uh, purpose, uh, we have uh, built the China Stroke Data Center uh, that is responsible for the data management and the service. Uh, this is the uh, uh, architecture of our database. Uh, the CSDC collect uh, uh, screen and uh, EMR data uh, from more than 3,000. Uh, 3,000 hospitals. Yeah. Now I will reduce, introduce uh, the data sources of the data center. Uh, until now, uh, we have collected uh, uh, 13 million data items in total, uh, include the community screen data and the inpatient and the outpatient follow-up data and some hospital uh, specific uh, uh, EHR data for the stroke patient from our base hospital. Uh, and why we try to use OpenHR to standard our data, uh, there are some challenges for our project. One is the data standardization. Uh, and other, we want to quickly design our software, uh, software uh, to provide uh, the data to the researchers and the hospitals. Uh, for example, we want to uh, quickly design some uh, API to connect our data center. So we use the open chart based technology to uh, flexible design the data access API and uh, some other challenges. Uh, so how we uh, do our modeling of uh, the data? The first we set goals of the modeling and then we establish a modeling working group uh, and finally start building the models
our modeling objects into the two uh, kinds of data. First is the stroke screening data. Uh, it is a, a China high risk uh, stroke population screen and the intervention work scale. And uh, another uh, kinds of data we want to standardize is the uh, specific disease in EMR for stroke. Uh, uh, include the article EMRs of three famous hospitals in China. Uh. This is the uh, mind map of the hospital stroke screen and the inter intervention data. Uh, include the discharge information, health, uh, the, the disease registration, uh, admission examination, uh, recruit criteria, and uh, so on. This is a form uh, uh, published by the government, uh, by the project, uh, the CSPP project, project officially. Uh. And for the specific disease EMR for stroke, uh, this is the mind map of the uh, data structure. Uh, mainly include the clinical evaluation and the neurological evaluation, uh, examination, patient information, complaint, uh, history of present illness, past history, personal family history, and the general examinations. The general examinations is common for uh, all kinds of uh, uh, diseases, but the neurological examination uh, is more specific to the disease, to the stroke. Uh, uh, this is an example uh, of the neurological examination. Uh, for example, is the consciousness, includes the consciousness, language, uh, intelligence. Uh, in, uh, they, 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 the standard is uh, according to the uh, clinical guidelines uh, for the neurological uh, uh, in our domain. Uh, when we uh, start uh, 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 confirm our uh, objective, so we can uh, begin the modeling. Uh, the method of building of the modeling include the eight steps. Uh, first, collect the data requirements, and the second, discuss and uh, understand the requirements. Uh, third, uh, search trans uh, corresponding archetypes in HCM and also in the locally uh, Chinese uh, H HMSA. Uh, and the four, uh, use mind maps to represent a template. Uh, five, use mind maps to re represent archetypes that need to be created, created or expanded. And the six, build the template and the uh, archetypes with HMSA. And the uh, seven, uh, review the template and archetypes. And last, we ad uh, adopt a template and archetypes to build our database. I will uh, explain the eight steps uh, in more detail. Uh, first, we, we should collect the data requirements for our program. Uh, the data we collect uh, mainly from the admission record, discard record, screen form, and uh, also for the um, um, reuse the common data, uh, the data elements and the terminology uh, terms. We also reference the uh, National uh, Stroke Institute uh, H NIH, uh, uh, they've published the N NIDS the, for, for the stroke uh, data common elements. Uh. A second, uh, we will discuss and uh, understand the requirements um, for uh, using the, uh, 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 we, we, we establish a working group uh, uh, 
include the clinicians, clinicians and uh, uh, medical informatics uh, uh, domain uh, experts. Um, third, we we'll search the corresponding archetypes in OpenShark Clinical uh, Knowledge Manager. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we need the needs uh, assessments, uh, named the needs uh, needs assessments. Uh, uh, we also find some uh, mis uh, mistakes. Uh, for example, uh, in CCAM, the uh, there there has a, a mis misspelling uh, for the uh, uh, archetype needs. They are misspelling the and the n i I, 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 uh, uh, I just uh, cannot remember the original uh, name, and we uh, advise the, the, to to correct to the uh, correct name. Uh, before we use the uh, mind maps to represent the template, for example, is the uh, uh, admission notes uh, uh, in. Most uh, uh, in most of the Chinese hospital, uh, uh, and when we uh, uh, after we uh, presented the admission notes in the mode, uh, uh, mind maps, we can uh, use the mind maps to, to re represent archetypes that are needed to, to be created or expanded. Uh, for uh, this example, for uh, the examination of uh, uh, cranial nerves, uh, the the yellow uh, flag uh, presents the extended archetype of CKM, and and the star represents a new attribute. Uh, not uh, in the current CCAM. Mm. And the red flag uh, represents a, a new archetype, uh, uh, not currently uh, not currently published in the CCAM, but uh, we uh, needed uh, in our project. Uh, uh, a known symbol uh, means that uh, we can directly use the archetype in the CCAM. After we uh, expand uh, or create a new archetype, we uh, we can we use the uh, health modeling collaboration tool uh, developed by the Zhejiang University uh, of the Xidong's uh, team. Uh. And the last, uh, we have remote viewing meeting or uh, face to face meeting to discuss the. Uh, archetypes and uh, templates, reviews the archetype and the template. We also, um, here we are thanks to uh, Dr. Heather. Uh, he also gave us a uh, very uh, valuable advice uh, to uh, present the, to, uh, to uh, revise our archetypes or template. Uh, the modern result is as follows. Um, in the uh, stroke screen and the intervention uh, databases, uh, we use 14 archetypes totally. Uh, that's uh, uh, the number uh, uh, need extended uh, in the CKM is 10 and uh, uh, 18 can use directly and we created 12 new uh, archetype, uh, but we have not uh, submitted to CCAM. We just uh, used it in uh, our project. In the future, we want to discuss to, with the um, uh, reviewers uh, to share uh, uh, archetype uh, uh, to the public. Uh, and uh, we also create uh, one template that is the hospital screen, stroke screen and the intervention. Uh, this is the uh, this is the list of the archetypes. Uh, many uh, archetypes is uh, 
uh, standard uh, assessment uh, from the neurological disease guidelines. Uh, so we think uh, that type archetype uh, can be submitted to CKM to share globally. Uh, and uh, some uh, archetypes is uh, specific, uh, specific uh, 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 so it's uh, more suitable uh, for Chinese uh, uh, situations. Uh, that is a template, the, the first level architecture. The template is, 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 uh, is um, uh, some, uh, uh, is a large uh, is a large template, and the specific disease uh, EMR EMR for stroke we have used uh, uh, thirty nine uh, thirty eight uh, archetypes uh, uh, two extended and directly used uh, twenty two and uh, uh, newly created the fourteen, and we have built a template uh, admission and the discard record for stroke. Uh, this is a list of the uh, specific disease EMR for stroke. Mm. Now, uh, uh, we have not uh, um, uh, completed the project. Uh, uh, some new archetypes are, uh, may be added in uh, future. Uh, the template is uh, uh, we have finished the admission notes. Uh, this can cover most of the uh, famous Chinese hospital in the um, neurological uh, uh, department uh, for the stroke disease. Uh, the admissions notes include uh, the patient information, uh, complement history and the present illness and past history, personal history, uh, physical examination, and uh, neurological immunization and so on. Uh, in the future, uh, our plan is to, we have generated the stroke database uh, with a system named the Clever System. Uh, we uh, uh, developed a uh, collaborative with uh, Xidong's uh, term, uh, Xidong's team. Uh, now we can uh, we uh, our experience uh, include uh, the demographic concept in CCAM are uh, different from uh, those in China. Uh, maybe uh, different uh, from country to other country. Uh, the construction of archetypes requires much uh, interdisciplinary knowledge, especially uh, need the uh, physicians to participate in. And, and other uh, an archetype definition should not be limited by technical implementation. Uh, building archetype should be an interactive, interactive uh, process. And the archetype management mechanism is the basis for ensuring thematic interoperability. Uh, in the future, we want to uh, continue our modeling of the uh, stroke standard uh, data standard and build a big data application for the uh, uh, research and uh, uh, screen uh, prevention of the, the patient uh, stroke patient. And, and we also want to, uh, to share our experience, experience and uh, uh, submit uh, our uh, a result uh, to the CKM uh, for sharing uh, globally, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh. Thank you, Professor Zhao. And uh, so uh, it's time for questions and comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I will share my screen. Okay, uh, so still there are several minutes for questions and uh, comments. So, question, <laughs> please wait just several minutes. And uh, I have noticed uh, Professor Zhao have mentioned about the uh, 
sharing the archetypes globally. So maybe this question is not for Professor Zhao, it's for uh, Heather. Uh, I think it's a very good thing to, to, to work together and to refine these models and so it can be published or distributed in the CCAM and for, 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 for the use of other teams. I totally agree. I would really welcome if you would make those proposals and we'll certainly take a look. And, and it might give some more refinements and feedback into your models as well. So I think collaboration around this and iteration is really important. Um, and I think we all win when we can do that. So please, if you think there are gaps and if there are problems, please make change requests. Please offer your archetypes that you think would uh, be useful to others. I think that's incredibly valuable. And that's how we've accumulated the number of archetypes that we have. It's by this sharing. Um, it comes from projects that are actually put in place and implemented. And so then we, we can start to share that with others, just as you've benefited from the archetypes that existed previously from other projects. Um, let's just keep that circle keeping going around. I think that's lovely. That's the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think. So uh, we we can uh, uh, we can pray it later. So I think it's better we can do same as the work we have been done uh, for the COVID nineteen monitoring. So we we will. Uh, so I see the results are from Professor Dong uh, Dong Sheng Zhao's results are including Chinese and English version. So it will be easy to discuss. And sounds perfect to me. Some comments. Okay, is that if is there any other questions? Uh, so the Xinji has asked what are the extended point in archetypes in stroke arch archetypes? So what parts are extended in the current stroke archetypes? It's muted, Professor Zhao, so you are muted, please. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the most extended point is uh, some new uh, uh, attributes, some new attributes that uh, the standard uh, archetypes are uh, not included, uh, especially uh, uh, for the um, uh, practice used in Chinese. Uh, uh, I can, uh, for example, in the admission, uh, in uh, admission, uh, 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 there are some new features has to be added, and uh, other uh, and some other uh, attributes uh, must be added in the archetype uh, is for the specific uh, needs for the uh, neurological uh, domain and numerical domain from the. Uh, to according to the uh, clinical guidelines. Uh. Okay, Xinyi, so is that uh, satisfies you? Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. So, mm. what the guideline is very interesting. Okay, so uh, we now move to the first speaker, Dr. Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank Dr. you. Is the lead, lead developer of EHR base. He was born in Geneva, Switzerland, now lives in Thailand since 19, uh, since 2009. He has developed the five commercial enterprise systems for finance and healthcare. He has founded a, ADOC software and uh, wrote SSS in 2011, and it has been migrated to EHR base. It's a very famous one. In, 19, in 2019. So uh, he will bring us the overview of the Germany national COVID-19 platform status of current EHR-based development, together with a quick introduction to Firebridge. So please, Christian. Thank you, Zhu Dong. Uh, yeah, um, just as a quick background, uh, basically, FSIS was really uh, almost personal challenge to implement an open EHR platform. And uh, it has been a, 
long and bumpy uh, road. And uh, in 2019, uh, we had a discussion with the people uh, in Germany uh, from the uh, medical, um, medical school in uh, Hanover medical university in Hanover, as well as people from the Vita group. And uh, we decided to, uh, to move on together to uh, implement uh, a platform to handle open EHR uh, object on Swan as a, as a repository. I would say that uh, since 2019, a lot of things has happened, uh, and I will actually you will see that through uh, my presentation. And uh, it has been a very hectic period. Uh, so originally, the the goal uh, of the, um, the the project was to create an open scalable and fair platform, fair platform for open EHR, and uh, that was actually. Uh, more oriented toward a generic uh, implementation to tackle all sorts of uh, medical uh, issues, oncology, and so on. <clears throat> and then, uh, as everybody knows, COVID-19 uh, occurred, and uh, it has been really a shift uh, in resources toward uh, providing a, a platform to gather all sorts of information coming from uh, essentially in Germany from the, the university hospital. And uh, so that's, a, that's the network actually. And uh, also Open EHR has been identified as the right uh, platform and format if you, if you want to be able to uh, ex uh, exploit the information uh, in, a, in a good way. So basically the querying is very important. And uh, so that is actually rather interesting because for, uh, to, to my information, to my knowledge, basically FIRE was actually evaluated as a pivot format. Uh, to be able to do all sorts of querying and so on. And it has not been seen as adequate. So I think it's really interesting here because we have really open EHR uh, at work uh, and it's good actually in, uh, it's used actually in a good way. So, So the, as a quick background, uh, HIMED uh, is, a, is a large consortium sponsored by the German government, and it's actually more than eight university hospitals. Uh, the later number, I think it's around 35 university hospitals. And uh, it's funded by the, by the Ministry of Science and Education. And it, it, has actually, uh, it has actually a significant budget. So that's actually for us, uh, it's not only for Airbase, it's uh, for a number of uh, uh, application uh, around that. It's, uh, it's really important because in many projects like that, the funding is really critical. And uh, I would say I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, we had a, a way to fund this kind of development. It's really a data infrastructure uh, and uh, that's uh, rather important. In fact, because uh, as you as you probably know, uh, exchanging data, whether it's called or so-called interoperable format, it doesn't resolve a lot of issues when it comes to actually do something with this data. And uh, so that's actually this data infrastructure or architecture is very important here. Uh, so it uses open EHR, obviously, and a number of uh, health information exchange format, uh, especially. XDS for historical reason, and obviously FIRE, because there are a lot of systems that are actually publisher of FIRE uh, message, I would say. I will not talk, ab I will not talk about FIRE as uh, a data repository, really. <clears throat> so the goal of IMED initially was to provide uh, this components as an op, uh, the components under open source license and it's basically Apache, Apache uh, 2.0. Uh, 
And that is actually a very nice uh, way to, uh, to move forward because these components are reusable uh, by anyone actually who wants to implement uh, the platform <clears throat> and to uh, enhance it somehow. Uh, we have actually in Airbase, we have a lot of contributors. Uh, if you go on GitHub, uh, uh, check, check it out uh, yesterday, and we had about 42 contributors. So it's quite significant. The joint development actually is between uh, the Hanover Medical School, Vata Group, and uh, myself here in Thailand. The, the objective uh, when we had the occurrence of uh, COVID-19, and there's a lot of things has happened actually in many countries, uh, of course in Germany, it was to figure out how to implement a right uh, IT infrastructure to handle the problem. And uh, especially in the case of <coughs> having accurate and fast information uh, to, to be consolidated uh, coming from various uh, entities, especially hospitals and clinics and so on. <clears throat> and another, another issue, and that's actually, uh, that actually has been a great opportunity to enhance the platform is to uh, gather all this information and uh, have actually a way to uh, analyze this information to provide guidelines and so on, especially at the point of care. So it's by, by direction. Another, another point is actually the updating of this information, either coming from hospital, but also from the patient themselves uh, to have a follow-up, <coughs> excuse me, a follow-up on uh, what is actually ongoing uh, post-discharge. So at a very high level, the national COVID-19 platform, and I will give you a quick overview of the architecture. <clears throat> so for research, uh, we have, uh, oh, to, uh, can, uh, yeah. for the, for the uh, research, uh, we have a central uh, data repository with pseudonymized data. This one is used for all sorts of uh, statistical analysis and so on, uh, which is provided to a research portal. <clears throat> the other one is a, a central transactional repository where we have a number of applications where uh, the citizen so on, can provide self-assessment, for example. Uh, and is actually based on uh, non-anonymized data. So uh, there's a, a direct relationship between an actual <coughs> subject, uh, patient, and uh, the, the, the health information, the health data. On a decentralized uh, platform, which is basically on an architect, architectural point of view, is the same side, uh, the, same, uh, the same one. And uh, it brings information uh, data at the point of care. And uh, that's actually going back to the university hospital within the network. So the NUM is actually the uh, medical university network. Uh, and the codex, I uh, should have actually, <laughs> is the COVID data exchange. <clears throat> so basically, on a, on a high level, uh, you have a number of uh, decentralized portals and so on at the university uh, hospital themselves that actually feed uh, the central uh, national platform of, uh, uh, for the COVID, so uh, the COVID data. So by the way, and I will introduce this uh, term later, but there is an agreed upon data set for COVID data, which is called GECOS here. So the German common uh, consensus uh, COVID uh, information exchange or something like that. I will get back to that. But anyway, uh, the, the important point actually, it's not uh, a free uh, format. Uh, it's well standardized and that's actually what is sent to the central system. 
uh, it's basically uh, the data set is fed uh, by fire mostly. Uh, and that's where we have the fire bridge to convert this message into uh, the structure information that we had in the, in the repository under the open, open EHR standard. <clears throat> uh, in terms of architecture, and I will discuss a number of components, but apart from the side of the uh, uh, front end portals and so on, uh, the core uh, components are um, the Firebridge and uh, Airbase. So Airbase is, uh, is the open EHR CDR, and it's actually populated by data coming from the Firebridge. Another aspect, <coughs> which is quite interesting, is basically we have a, 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 a support uh, which is not uh, here uh, depicted here, but uh, we can uh, send back information on the file format coming from Airbase. The transactional repository uh, has uh, almost the same type of component, Firebridge, Airbase, and so on. Uh, of course, the security area is quite critical uh, considering the sensitive information because information are not anonymized. And we have a demographic service, uh, which is populated by data coming from FIRE. Uh, uh, so another key aspect of this architecture is the strong uh, authentication mechanism, as well as the access control. A very high level synopsis uh, uh, and depicting actually the different components we have, uh, and the one I will discuss further in this presentation. So uh, at the top uh, uh, of that uh, diagram, you have the number of uh, different applications that are developed uh, for, the, for this particular uh, use case. And uh, uh, they actually uh, dialogue with the, the platform, uh, which is here in pinkish color. There are three very important components here uh, to, uh, to address. Uh, is one is what we call the Open EHR SDK. That's actually a, a, a new development that is part of the Airbase uh, suite, if you like. But uh, what is really significant here with the SDK, it's not specific to Airbase, it's vendor neutral. So uh, I will detail what it does. Uh, on, a, on a very high level, the SDK just gives you a very high level abstraction of the actual open air representation, including access paths to objects and so on. So it makes things really easy on a programmatic standpoint to, uh, to deal with open air templates. <clears throat> Uh, because it provides the programmatic interface uh, in a Java environment that you can directly use without having too much knowledge about how actually it, it is used to interact with the, with the database, with the, sorry, with the CDR itself. Another <clears throat> important component, of course, is Airbase. Uh, so uh, I guess a lot of people here are familiar with it. That's actually a uh, fully compliant open EHR uh, uh, CDR. And the Firebridge, uh, which is quite new, which is operating a translation between fire resources and uh, uh, open EHR entities. So 
So Airbase, uh, it's a modern architecture, but the problem is when we talk about modern architecture, we are always worried about having all this stuff coming from the Silicon Valley and uh, there are all sorts of exotic stuff uh, that actually uh, replaced uh, the year after and so on. So it's really hard to follow. Here actually one of the design principle was uh, since ethosis basically was to stick uh, to down to earth IT principle. The thing is actually in my experience, uh, when it comes to deploying uh, health information system, uh, exotism in terms of technology uh, is, not, uh, is not really appreciated. It's, uh, it's seen as a very high risk factor. And uh, here we are not doing actually an application for the laboratory, I mean the IT laboratory, we are really doing uh, uh, an enterprise system that is actually is used and uh, must be reliable and uh, have actually uh, well-known technology. So it's very important in terms of uh, human resource maintenance and so on and so on. So that's actually the main principle. The other uh, aspect, it's open source. So it can be used very uh, in a very liberal way into all sorts of application uh, without restriction. It depends on open source components. Uh, of course, when you go under open source uh, Apache license, uh, well, some vendor do that actually, some part uh, is open source and some other parts are actually proprietary, which makes things really quite difficult when you want, when you want to integrate it. So basically it's based on well-known uh, technologies, uh, Java 11, uh, well, uh, Java 11 plus, I would say. Spring Boot. Spring Boot has been a, a major change from Ethersys because uh, Spring Boot is, uh, is well known by a vast number of developers and uh, to resolve a number of issues uh, internally that are too long to explain here. But what is really important here when in terms of uh, it, it comes for staffing and so on and also uh, to transfer the technology, it's way easier. It's still uh, used heavily PostgreSQL. Uh, the reason is PostgreSQL has been very early in, implement, in implementing hybrid uh, technology at database level, which blend uh, relational information and non-relational, uh, non non-SQL data, if you like. And that's actually a very strong support we have here because it integrates document-like data type uh, inside the database that is actually queryable, indexable, and so on. We use uh, the Java object-oriented query, uh, which is called Joke, and it's actually a very nice uh, front-end, uh, sorry, a very nice framework to uh, implement SQL uh, inside an application without having to implement the actual queries themselves. So that's a very neat environment. And we have a, a very good ecosystem around that, especially regarding the testing, quality assurance, uh, and so on. It's, uh, it's designed uh, as a transactional system. And that is rather important because uh, unlike uh, we've seen in uh, uh, other interpretation. We, the key is actually we want to have uh, accurate and reliable information. So currently, uh, in terms of release, uh, Airbase uh, has uh, a large number of uh, open air uh, standard feature implemented. In terms of format, it supports JSON and XML, also the flat formats now. Uh, a lot of regarding the uh, archetype definition language is fully supported. The transactional aspect uh, and validation is a key uh, is a key function, a key feature of the platform. 
uh, the constraint, uh, uh, constraint uh, enforcement coming from the template is checked that each time we uh, we input a new uh, open EHR object into the platform. The thing is actually when you want to use the open EHR directly using the REST API, uh, you just follow the open EHR REST API specification. So there are some enhancements, I would say, uh, especially when it comes to functions on this kind of things, but basically uh, uh, in HUL, but uh, it's a full support of the specification. It has an admin console, uh, which does uh, where we can do a number of uh, uh, administrative operation uh, regarding uh, cleanup, uh, deleting EHRs, this kind of things. Uh, it supports uh, OAuth uh, security. New feature, uh, to couple of two interesting features is the logging, uh, audit log uh, following Atna specification, as well as uh, fire uh, terminology server uh, integration for validation. The SDK, uh, the Open EHR SDK, uh, is a very neat way to uh, implement a system. So, just to make it quick, you generate the software called the programmatic interface from Open EHR templates directly. There is a code uh, generator that you invoke uh, from a template. Uh, and then afterward, uh, you use. Uh, the these classes uh, as your interface. Inside uh, the SDK, it takes care actually of uh, handling uh, the, the, the data you have represented into your code uh, and uh, to convert that into the relevant open EHR format to send to the database. So basically it's a kind of uh, high level uh, middleware if you like. Uh, so there is a full encapsulation of the REST API inside the SDK. And uh, there is also uh, uh, an easy way to implement uh, HUL queries using Java classes. There is a large number of tests uh, associated uh, with the SDK. Uh, for uh, especially for uh, integration testing. So there are other between 300 to 400 tests uh, that are performed. And that's not the only one, actually the whole suite of tests, uh, including uh, unit testing, uh, integration testing and regression testing is over, it's probably around 1000, something like that. It's vendor neutral. So you can use it of course for Airbase, uh, thank you. But you can use also, you can use uh, also the SDK for other open EHR platform that are compliant with the REST API. In terms of security, uh, we have been doing a strong effort. It's probably uh, one of the uh, aspects, you know, with the GDPR and so on in, uh, in Europe, in Germany. Uh, it has been really a very strong requirement. So we have a uh, worst authentication uh, when it comes to a uh, uh, real life deployment. Specifying uh, role-based access control uh, on the REST end endpoint. And there's a key cloud configuration regarding the uh, user access and so on. The, the other aspect we're doing the platform, it's not uh, OS deployment. Of course, it's a, it's a Java application, so that's nice. You have, uh, and we have Docker images uh, readily available uh, for Airbase uh, and uh, the, all the other components. So as uh, maybe you've noticed on the architectural, uh, architectural diagrams, uh, the whole architecture is Dockerized. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's actually orchestrated by a Kubernetes. 
Another strong aspect is uh, the database uh, use the Postgres, of course, features when it comes to replication. Uh, and one, one question that comes a lot is about scalability. So uh, it's not well known, but uh, PostgreSQL is not the Microsoft access. Uh, you can do really a lot when it comes to uh, hyper scalability on so on. Uh, and it's really a uh, high uh, and professional enterprise database system. And it's cloud ready, uh, which is not the case with Eversys in the past. So you can deploy uh, on various uh, cloud providers uh, because uh, using the managed uh, Postgres component they are providing without further extensions. Firebridge, uh, briefly, uh, it's a broker between fire uh, resources and providers and uh, the OpenHR Open repository. Again, in this scenario, it's not dependent on uh, Airbase. It's dependent on uh, the OpenEHR SDK that I've described before. Well, that's rather interesting because that's a reusable component that you can use in uh, all different of uh, uh, use cases, including multi-vendor uh, deployments. So uh, as you might expect, I search on retrieve data from uh, fire enable host. actually the host uh, send the resources. And uh, since it's based on uh, uh, happy fire, so we have all the, all the uh, I would say the goodies when it comes to uh, search on retrieval resources and so on. Of course, the main goal is to transform these resources into open EHR compositions. So that's actually a tool chain like you will see in the next diagram that actually provide you with uh, a number of components, especially when it goes, comes to converters, uh, converting resources to <coughs> open EHR composition. Of course, the open EHR composition are based on templates, hence the use of the open EHR SDK. It validates the data. Uh, so another key aspect is the validation of the data uh, with uh, the fire terminology server. It stores the data uh, locally, so as a reference, really. Uh, as you probably know, when it comes to happy fire and so on, <clears throat> the data, fire data, fire messages are actually stored as blob. There are some indexing on the on these blobs are uh, using lucent and so on, but that's actually not very efficient as opposed to a real structure database where it comes to uh, uh, indexing possibility, partial indexing and so on. We have we can do really a lot actually with a true uh, relational uh, repository. Here actually it's more basic when it comes to uh, performing search and so on. So here uh, it's uh, the Firebridge focus and the components we have uh, are focusing on the Gecko dataset. So this German Corolla consensus dataset uh, I evoked before. And uh, that's where we have a large number of components uh, uh, transform templates that are used into this Firebridge. So likewise, uh, with the other components, the design principle is uh, open source license. It's completely based on uh, the OpenEHR SDK. So uh, it's not specifically uh, dependent on Airbase. It runs, uh, it's a separate process. Uh, it can be distributed, of course. You can have a number of uh, servers running, but it's independent of uh, Airbase uh, runtime environment. Of course, it used the fire endpoints uh, when it comes to uh, perform the basic fire operation, code and so on. And where we have the mapping and uh, that's the whole system is to how to map these resources to open EHR and sending this transformed data to Airbase. 
well here or any open EHR CDF. So uh, at the moment, uh, we have quite already, and if you are curious, when you go into the, uh, the GitHub repository, you will see there are a number of the already available mappings. At the end, actually, what is uh, targeted and uh, fully with a number of contributors is to have a global mapping library for fire to open EHR. Oh. Oh. It's blocked. Sorry? Uh, so the slides do not move on. It seems uh, my, my 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 machine is frozen. You can hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear hear you. Okay, well, it's not so far. Ah, okay, it's it's coming back to life. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Uh, that's the network is very unstable because we have uh, we have uh, uh, ah. Hang on. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see that. Ah, okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Technology-wise, it's uh, there are some changes uh, regarding what is actually uh, depicted in the in the, um, uh, in the documentation. But what is really important here, it used the uh, ELS integration platform, and especially it used a, a very uh, interesting component is the CAMEL. Uh, information bus. So that uh, information bus is actually used for the routing uh, between the mappings on the converter uh, when a resource uh, is uh, to be transformed. And also on the way back. But actually, there is a small uh, information bus within the firebridge, if you like. There are a number of uh, different formats that actually are supported. Uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, XDS and HL7 out of the box. That is actually provided by IPF. And also very nicely, and that's what we reuse elsewhere, it's uh, providing the audit lock uh, with conformance to ATNA specification. Now uh, to uh, deal uh, with the fire resources and host and so on, uh, we used a happy fire uh, with its own persistence engine and the persistence engine uh, feeds the uh, PostgreSQL database as well. So that's where we have the parsing, searching and the retrieval of uh, resources using the published uh, fire XML uh, fire profile. Here we use XML mostly. I mean, XML profile. Uh, so it validates the, the resources and pierces them. And then we have the SDK that I actually uh, explained before to uh, manipulate the data uh, and uh, perform the querying on the open HR resource as well if needed. Post Spring Boot and PostgreSQL. So uh, nothing quite different from the other parts except uh, uh, in regard of the fire resources themselves. So here, actually, we need to move this stuff somewhere. Okay. So it's a very uh, standard tool chain uh, when it comes to interpreting that, uh, interpreting fire resources. Uh, it's fairly simple, in fact. Uh, it's, uh, and I think that makes things uh, quite interesting because uh, since it's a very uh, easy access component, uh, it can be really reused and uh, ex extended very easily, I would say. The thing is, actually, when it comes to that, uh, there is a very important point. It's not a graphical, uh, very nice uh, a la intersystems 
software, you know, where you just click uh, uh, on uh, some uh, nodes and then you, you draw an arrow to another one and this kind of, kind of thing. I'm sure some of you have, have seen that. Well, the thing is actually, when it comes to converting fire resources uh, and to open EHR, you need a, a quite a high level of expertise in uh, both sides. So it's really a health informatician uh, task. And for that reason, uh, we have kept uh, this process to be more or less manual. By manual, I mean, there's coding involved uh, to do the transformation. But the, as I as explained before, uh, the library of transformation connectors, con uh, converter from fire resource is expanding and is actually fire, as you know, is uh, ballot based. So basically it doesn't change that much. So uh, it's quite easy to reuse these components. Of course, the, the semantics of data mapping depends specifically on the, the fire profile. Uh, one thing which is rather very important also, fire resources uh, may map to a number of composition, not a single one. And that's why actually this uh, integration needs to be manual. Of course, on open EHR, uh, on open EHR side, uh, you deal with uh, standard templates. The router uh, within the information bus uh, specify actually does the dispatch to, uh, uh, to the different converter uh, if needed uh, for a particular use case. And that's about it really. I've just for uh, for reference, I just put here the uh, the link to uh, GitHub repository as well as some uh, documentation, high level documentation on Airbase. But basically, everything I've discussed here, uh, except the uh, high level deployment and architecture, as into uh, are in GitHub directly, fully accessible. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, so I noticed in the message box, Shara has asked the question, but uh, has already answered that. that so, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, question two any detailed tutorial related to fiber implementation? Question. Excuse me. The, the sharer has the second question. Any detailed tutorial related to fire bridge implementation? Is there any? Yeah, topic? yeah, well, yeah, sure. Uh, there, are, there, is, there is a good documentation. Uh, com, uh, well, there are two ways. <clears throat> Obviously on uh, GitHub, uh, you will find a, a lot of uh, details uh, regarding the implementation on uh, I would say the documentation is the, is the source code, but no, uh, there is documentation as well, which is referenced uh, in the GitHub repository to the Firebridge implementation, as well as, uh, uh, of course, you can directly uh, interact to the developers if you have any specific questions. Okay, is that satisfy you, Sherry? So is there any other questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so I think it's it's great work that you're doing uh, with the HR base. It's amazing. And uh, my first question is regarding uh, authentication. So uh, you're using Keycloak to do all the OAuth style authentication. And then where do you implement uh, the authorization? Is it at the Keycloak level or do you do it at uh, EHR base? We are doing it at EHR base level. It's actually okay, so, it's Spring Boot. Got it, got it. So is there object-based yeah. authentication available? So some templates can only be accessed by some people and some compositions only by some doctors or patients, things like that, can it be implemented? It can be implemented, yeah. I actually, I've been working on that already at FSC's level uh, to uh, provide fine-grained uh, access level uh, depending on, <clears throat> on uh, who is doing what. And which purpose and so on, which object. 
Uh, there are different levels. Uh, one very important uh, uh, aspect regarding this is the raw level security uh, when it comes to database. Because one of the issues, and we all always look at that on an external standpoint, uh, uh, when we analyze the security of the system, uh, it comes to uh, what can you do from uh, the portal. But there are a lot of people gravitating around the database itself. So you, for example, as an administrator, are you eligible to have access to medical data held by the database? Obviously, uh, the, the, there is no informed consent supporting this. So basically, you are not eligible to access this data when mm -hmm. it comes to GDPR. And that's hence uh, what is so important to have a, a way to implement raw level security where you have specific policies to allow a different set of uh, users or roles uh, to a specific uh, subset of the information, regardless of how this information is actually used from. So as an administrator, even actually you have the right to uh, deal with the database itself, you cannot directly query it if you don't have the, if you're not granted this privilege, that's the idea. Got it, got it. And the second one is regarding deployment in the cloud. So I'm aware that yeah. uh, EHR-based, the Postgres uh, instance uses a few extensions. Uh, so when you deploy it ah. in a cloud without these extensions, what doesn't work? No, actually uh, there is a cloud uh, in, uh, in the YAML configuration of the application and that's what we use by default. It's cloud-based cloud or it doesn't use the, open, uh, the Postgres extension. Okay. And uh, just for your information, we're going to drop these uh, extensions altogether because they are not needed anymore. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Yeah. It's a use uh, in Scotland, uh, in, for example, in Scotland, uh, also in Germany, but in Scotland, they are deploying it on uh, AWS or Azure, probably Azure. And uh, no, there is no extensions. That's we have, we have been removing. We have removed that uh, for quite a while, I think six months ago. Okay, so uh, thank, thank you, Christian. So we will thank move you. to the uh, fifth speech. So Dr. Siddharth Ramsh is a doctor by training, self-taught programmer on YouTube. He's new to OpenAI and I I think he will bring his new insight and work about open air. So please, Dr. Sinhash. Yeah, uh, hi, hi everyone. So I'm new to open air, as you can see. And uh, my journey uh, with open air began uh, with trying to make digital forms. So my hospital had a lot of forms and they wanted to make a digital version of that. And uh, I discovered open air, started making these templates and that's when I discovered how well thought out all of these archetypes were. Most of the things, almost 80 to 90 percent of the requirements were met by uh, the archetypes in the CKM and the community is also great. Uh, Dr. Ian helped me a lot with modeling all of these things and I was successful in making the templates. Now comes the next question. What do you do with these templates? You need to make an application that actually persists onto a CDR, right? So that's when like Creating an open air composition is actually really hard. And as even uh, Mr. Christian told, they are coming up with these SDKs to actually interact with open air and making this instance is pretty hard. So the solutions we have right now are, uh, we can generate the clinical document uh, instance uh, using uh, these tools that we have. Uh, then we have uh, an example endpoint uh, in most of the CDRs that are coming inbuilt right now. And we have uh, the EHR based SDK. But the problem with that is you need to have another layer of complexity. You need to have a certain other client running and it's in Java, so you can't actually deploy it on your front-end application. And web apps are mostly how people build apps these days. So I wanted something different. I wanted, to, uh, and then there are these form builders. There are these automated form builders that when you give a template, it automatically you know uh, generates this UI for you and you can just drag and drop things around. Uh, so my dilemma was this, I need to make digital forms. So this needs to be made as soon as possible. 
So I could just manually, you know, without the use of all these fancy form builders, without paying them, make them in uh, four hours, uh, getting the example compositions. But since I'm a self-taught programmer, I have to go uh, the second way. And that's what I did. Um, so th that's, uh, I made it open source and called it Medblocks UI. And uh, it got the work done. It, it kind of, uh, I was able to get usable interfaces out of a template. You just drag and drop a template and it generates this sort of interface. Uh, but it doesn't look like this immediately. You need to go through a lot of configuration options in order to make it look like this. Uh, and in fact, I just put it up online and uh, a lot of people, th that's the thing about code, right? Once you make it and you put it up, you don't know what people will make with it, wonderful things. And uh, yeah, so people started using it and uh, it's not even fully done yet. Like you can see that the DV daytime is not implemented at uh, that certain thing, but it's, it's not even completed and people are still trying to use it and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, so what's the problem with current uh, you know, form builders and all of these things. So the thing is, we are limited to a components that they give you. So if they don't have it in their library and they don't have it configured, you are out of luck. You can't do anything that you want. So that's mine and that's uh, Better's uh, form builder. Uh, and sometimes the configuration gets really complex. Like for example, this is a display function in uh, my application where if this JavaScript expression uh, returns true, it will show a particular part of the form. And if it returns false, it doesn't. Uh, then, uh, you know, better form builder also has these sort of functions, um, round, min, max, et cetera. Uh, this is Solid Cloud's product and uh, they have a wonderful product. And again, that's just uh, a JavaScript expression right there. Uh, and again, uh, better Swarm Builder having APIs uh, so you can talk to different services. Uh, it, it got really, you know, bloated at some point where uh, I thought, you know, you, when you have padding top, right, bottom and left inside your Swarm Builder, are we just reinventing, you know, HTML, CSS and JavaScript again? Because it seems like using a GUI, we are almost building a very similar uh, interface. Uh, so, and then there was this uh, Twitter thread. <clears throat> Uh, and this particular comment got to me, uh, which was show me uh, a low code or a Visuvig editor that can build this particular UI. And this is what the UI looks like. It's built by uh, Dr. Mark Waddle from Wales and uh, it's for bottling uh, toxin administration. So you, you get, uh, you need to point out on the face where exactly you want to give this injection. And you mentioned the uh, volume and the units are automatically calculated. The total is automatically calculated. The side of the face is also computed automatically. So things like this is not really possible with form builders, right? So what has changed from then? Like firstly, uh, making a composition has become much more simpler now. Uh, thanks to simplified JSON formats, especially flat format. And that is almost universal coverage, including EHR base supports uh, flat forms uh, right now. Uh, and the backend has gotten much more complex. Uh, you have a lot of services and uh, microservices running uh, and your application needs to talk to all of them. So the backend has changed dramatically. And front end also has changed. The way we deploy apps today is mostly as web applications. Gone are the days where you make a single standalone desktop application for each computer. Making web apps just is easier. Like you can deploy it faster, or you can iterate much faster. And as a result, most of the heavy lifting and the logic has moved on to the front end. And the back end is just like a, a persistence layer that uh, the front end uses. And so we have this uh, explosion of tooling. Right, we have Angular, React, Vue, and hundreds of other frameworks coming out every month or so. And uh, these frameworks will change, but the concept is here to stay. So uh, then the platform itself has evolved. Like browsers right now support something called web components. So you can have this sort of a HTML element, and thus this element can be used anywhere. Like it can be used in Vue, React, Angular, and it can also be used in your backend frameworks. So if you have a Django application or a Spring Boot application, you can uh, embed this in your uh, templates and it will show up a, on uh, the page uh, without any issue. So this is a browser technology. It's not uh, specific to any particular uh, vendor again. And people already use it. Like if you've seen the YouTube sign-in button, they're using web components. Like almost uh, 30 to 40% of the web uses web components already. And this is EHR Studio and their form renderer 
already uses a uh, web component. That's how they deploy these forms. Uh, so I thought, why do we just have this one form renderer that talks to uh, their own you know, vendor specific form rendering API and uh, gets the display? Instead of that, why don't we have something open that can do something like this? Like you have uh, an MB form, which is Medblock's form. And under that, you have all that you want. And you can uh, align them any way you like. You can have it in columns, tabs, and all of that is handled by normal HTML. And this uh, final thing will then output a composition. So this also enables us to build sort of components that talk to each microservice separately. So like microservices, now you can also have micro frontends. So I'll just show you what is uh, possible right now. Uh, so this is the setup. We have a basic template just for a demo. Uh, so we have a problem diagnosis, we have a, a blood pressure archetype, and we have a pulse or heartbeat. And this ID is uh, initial assessment v0.1. And we have an EHR base instance running uh, right now on port 8080. And this is just a EHR ID that I generated. Uh, now let's see, like first what you do is uh, you make a HTML file and you get a web template of that, just export a web template, put it in this directory. Uh, then you get a snippet. You just copy and paste these snippets from the Medblocks UI uh, NPM or GitHub page. And after this, we also have uh, a Medblocks. Uh, so, so first we need to create uh, these components, these custom elements, and you see the submit button automatically generates that particular button. This is the Medblocks UI VS Code extension, right? And uh, so here we have all of these things generated from the template. We can copy all of that directly and paste it as snippets. And we have a UI generating uh, right there. And that's it. So for example, if you don't want this problem diagnosis to be a select and you want it to be a search, you just replace that with another component. And right now it's talking to a SNOMED CT search engine in the background with the constraint of condition. Uh, so we are filling that out. And uh, right now we are just making the defaults uh, MM G so that people don't have to fill that out every single time. Uh, and all of this can look any way you want again. Again, now we are pasting Axios so that we can actually talk to the HR base instance to make this uh, composition persist. So all we need to do is get the form using a query selector and create a, you know, an Axios instance and give that as the CDR, the template, give it as the template, the HR ID, give it as HR. And on submit, we basically do form.post. And that's basically it. I'm just going to show you uh, as an alert right now. And uh, let's let's fill this out again. So this can look any way you want. And uh, here we just talk to EHR base, and this is a response coming from EHR base. Again, you see that the UID has been created, and this composition has been sent. So in using this, you can make a basic looking uh, UI in about two to three minutes. Uh, but that's the point. This is just to show you a demo, and there is not many fancy styling, and all of that is up to you. Uh, you can customize it using CSS. Uh, so all of this is open today, Medblocks UI components and the Medblocks UI VS Code extension, uh, and you can download it, use it, give me feedback. Uh, so what about this? This looked pretty complex. Is this possible using uh, our, uh, our, our form builder? Yeah, of course it is. Like, let's do that right now. And uh, I'll show you the setup. So we have a bottle in medication uh, template and it has a precise anatomical location to store the XY coordinates. It has a dosage archetype, which has the amount and units. And using this template, let's just extract the web template of this and put it in our directory and we are going to build it. Uh, but it takes a long time. So I'm just going to show you the final end product and just explain it to you. So this is the final end product. I mean, there is no standardized face, right? So I'm just using my face. Uh, so based on the side clicked, it gets left face or right face. And uh, you can you see that it is automatically calculated. And upon submit, it submits a composition. Again, here we are using EHR base. Uh, it submits this composition directly to EHR base from the front end. Uh, so how did we do this? So we are using Svelte. Svelte is just another front end library like Angular, Vue, or React. And using that, we are generating these uh, this HTML. Like so, that Svelte renders this HTML. So every time somebody clicks on this face, the state changes. The state is basically uh, injections, right? So every time somebody clicks on uh, this particular face, the x and y coordinates of this is registered as injection. 
uh, and as the array changes our svelte uh, you know the framework takes care of rendering things as it should and here there is just an each loop so it's just a for loop uh, you will be very familiar if you use view or uh, react so it's just a for loop and what we are doing here is uh, for each injection we need to generate a particular row right so for each row we are generating the path here the path and we are dynamically generating the path so that the flat form is respected properly for each uh, element and uh, this is the medication item and we are just setting it as botulinum and it's just a text field so we are just setting it as we could have made it snowmed city but it's botulinum and we are hiding it so it's there it's there in the background uh, but since we are using the css class is hidden to hide it it doesn't show up on the interface uh, and again mb input uh, this is for uh, the body site name so again the body site name we are generating the path dynamically and here for the data we are generating whether it's a right face or left uh, face it's based on what the x value is so you can dynamically do these things right inside of your uh, web component instead of having fancy uh, tooling the gui does that does this and here again mb quantity we are binding uh, the injection dot x to a mag quantity so since quantity takes in unit and magnitude we are doing it like that uh, and uh, this is also hidden so it doesn't show up here but it's there so all of this you can just copy and paste using the medblocks ui uh, vs code extension so if you do that it will also show you whether your interface currently is compliant with this template so this template right now is not compliant it shows that some uh, exclamatory marks here so you have to make sure that uh, those snippets are also pasted and those are present uh, everything else has a double check so it, it means it's all fine uh, so what about this how are we computing this automatically when a user inputs a uh, dose amount so the dose amount is an mb quantity so we are taking uh, we are binding to that directly in on mb input mb input is just whenever people type in it changes that so on changing we bind directly to injections again so we change the state of injections every time somebody changes this and once that uh, is changed we can again render using uh, the normal flow so here we are are uh, doing uh, total ml and uh, the units so that's just javascript we are doing a map reduce and uh, we get out the result uh, and all of the styling was done using css right like i used boomer and some css but you can use any framework of your choice you can use bootstrap tailwind uh, everything is fine uh, so what about retrieving the composition we need we are posting it and all that is fine but what about getting it back uh, I made a full demo. I wanted to show you, but then it's pretty long, and uh, it, it was uh, not possible within this time frame. So I'm just showing you what I'm doing here. So there is a load function where if you put the UUID, uh, I'm just going to Google and coming back to show you that it works. It it still loads back uh, the. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, it still loads back uh, the uh, information on the screen. Uh, so. that is how you know uh, the load works and exactly how it works is we get the composition using this form dot get uid again this makes a request to hrbs gets the form and we have some helper functions like get structured which will uh, take the path until which you want and then uh, map uh, you know get it in a structured form so it's flat forms are not easy to work with when you are uh, especially making uh some javascript manipulation so for that we have the structured form and this will get the structured form even though uh, ehr base doesn't support structured form right now it gets it using javascript code in the front end uh, and then we can then map that to injections directly and once you set that we have the state right so state directly renders that out uh to our ui Uh, and all of these uh, things like anatomical location precise anatomical location x offset magnitude all of these can just be copied and pasted using the copy id of the medblocks ui extension uh, and you can use any framework actually it need not be svelte all of these frameworks support loading a state and rendering things so all of these can be used uh, angular view preact all supported fully react doesn't because it's just weird like that uh, so don't use react if you want to use this uh, so the thing is frameworks change all the time but browsers are here to exist right browsers are going to be here and all of the browsers today support uh, custom elements and web components they are stable and a lot of people use it so don't rely on a single javascript framework 
but rely on uh, standard uh, DOM implementations and you know browser technology that is going to stay for a long time. As uh, Christian also said, like don't it's not exotic technology; it's stable. People are using it, and it's it's all fine. Uh, so now, can you use it in your you know handlebars or Django or PHP template? Absolutely, it's just uh, HTML. You can use it anywhere. Uh, can you have responsive layouts? In fact, the previous one I showed you, the previous example was responsive, and we are doing that using normal media queries. Uh, can you use it with X? If the browser supports it, uh, supports it, yes, you can use it uh, with anything else in the browser too. So, can you create new components? Yeah, you can, and I will show you an example. So here we just uh, we are like uh, describing a new component called crazy quantity to uh, replace our normal quantity. You will know why it's called crazy in some time. And we're just including that script tag. And we have a Medblocks UI configuration file uh, where you can tell the extension, hey, this is a new uh, snippet that I want to be I want to include. And uh, once you go to your index file, you can just go to the extension and uh, you see that it'll show up. The crazy quantity snippet shows up. And you just replace that snippet with uh, any snippet of your choice. In this case, we are using the crazy quantity. And uh, it shows up. So uh, it's it's not the best example, but this is, yeah, it's that looks like our systolic. So I don't recommend that you use this particular example, but you can use your own components. You can bring your own components when you have a design language. So when you are using something like Bootstrap or Tailwind CSS in your own project, you can uh, bring your design system into Medblocks UI. Instead of using the MB quantity, you can have your own companies quantity uh, text and coder text elements. Uh, although you would have to design a lot of uh, things to talk to the microservices like search uh, and Snowmed City and all that. So all of this was built on the shoulder of Jens, especially uh, EHR base for all of the persisting and uh, all of that. So <clears throat> Hermes was uh, uh, the terminology service that I used. It has a fire implementation too. Uh, and it was built by uh, Dr. Mark Waddle, the same guy who showed uh, the demo of the bottle and injection. And other technologies like Svelte, Shoelace, and uh, Lit Element uh, were used in the actual product and the demo. Uh, so the documentation is not great. I'm still working on it. Uh, the code is the documentation for now. Uh, so any questions? Thank you. Very excellent work. So yeah. Now it's time, time for questions. Is there any questions? Uh, good morning, Dr. Siddharth. I have a question. Yeah. Dr. Siddharth, when you are trying to map onto the open EHR reference model data types, mm -hmm. so if you are introducing a new crazy quantity as a data type, then right. what do you think how you will be mapping it to the open EHR RM model? Yeah, good, good question. Good question. So what we have is uh, we have a base model from which all of these models extend from. So if you have a crazy quantity, it still needs to implement the quantity base model properly. So the quantity base model will have units and magnitude, for example. So in this case, the base model uh, for quantity should be extended by this crazy quantity. And then there they can extend their, uh, you know, implement their own rendering function. So the quantity need not look a certain way. It can uh, look any way you want. You can do the validation any way you want, but it should implement the base uh, uh, thing, which is all implemented in TypeScript. So I can show you an example if you want to, but- uh, I, I, I got it, I got it. I okay, understood that. And the next question to you is, how will the clinicians or the doctors in your hospital be able to query this particular system? because you are storing the compositions, you are retrieving the compositions, but the person who is not being aware of that, what a composition is, so might not mm -hmm. be able to understand it. So is there an easy to use interface to be used by the doctors in the hospitals that uh, should be able to query? Okay, this is, uh, this is, for example, the query is like this one, find all the patients between the systolic pressures between this particular range. So is no, there a uh, UI? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is basically meant as a tool for developers to build interfaces. So if you talk about uh, querying an interface, you have AQL. So if you use AQL and get the data directly from uh, uh, something like uh, EHR base or any open EHR repository, you get that data and then you display it onto your uh, page. 
So if you think about an app, it will have multiple templates and it will have multiple views, right? One will be entering data, one will be editing data. And just like that, you can have a dashboard for different kinds of views where the doctor wants to see all the patients about this particular blood pressure. So things like that you need to do with AQL and your uh, uh, front end technology. Again, like you can use any framework and uh, you can also just build it from scratch. So Medblocks UI right now hasn't done too much on the AQL uh, side of things. It's mostly about entering data as compositions, but AQL is already well supported uh, as just a JSON standard. Like you can just make a request, get that data and display it. So it's not meant for doctors to be using directly. It's more uh, as a tool for uh, developers to build upon. Okay, thank you so much. But for implementing an AQL, as far as to the best of my knowledge, I guess uh, AQL parser and the license for that also needs to be purchased before uh, we should. Not, not really. I, I feel you can uh, execute AQL pretty straightforward. Like if building AQL is an issue, I think uh, uh, I think the German team is again coming up with a few open source tools. Uh, I think maybe Mr. Christian will be able to tell more. Uh, but but yeah, I, I feel if you if you understand the AQL spec pretty uh, well, you can compose your own AQL, get the data, and display it however you want. Yeah, regarding the AQL editor, we are currently well. Actually, it's uh, almost pre-release. We have uh, an SDK tool to implement AQL queries. Actually, I'm using it for test. Uh, so it's uh, it's Java based again. But it's not graphical, if that is your question. But I would say when it comes to that, uh, also implementing straight AQL queries, it's not really difficult, really. Uh, but you can use the tool, uh, you can use the SDK, and uh, you can also have a peek uh, to figure out what is the actual, the actual AQL queries, if needed. OK, thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, it's a uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks So the next uh, speaker will be uh, Dr. Shannan. Uh, he has been graduated from Zhejiang University and currently is working as an associated professor in Hainan University, China. And uh, he and uh, I are working together in some projects. This time he will introduce his recent project of CRG Builder based on open air, which targeted to providing an easy to use way for clinicians to build the computer interpretable guidelines and implemented them in the clinical practices. So, Shan, could you please start the presentation? So, uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to share our recent work on how to use open air approach for uh, clinical decision support purpose. So uh, as Professor Liu just mentioned, this is a joint work. So this is collaboration between three parties, which forms a little triangle. So uh, it is uh, Dr. Uh, Li from uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences in Beijing who proposed this, this uh, requirements and uh, Professor Liu and me are working on the technical solutions uh, since, we, since I was in Zhejiang University and I have recently moved to a uni new university in Hainan province, which is to the south of China. So uh, we have worked uh, together for this project for specific motivations. This is how to uh, computerize guidelines, which is used for clinical uh, diagnosis and treatment decisions. So the traditional approach of making clinical guidelines useful is by education, but with the development of uh, information sciences, it is now possible to encode clinical guidelines into computerized uh, interpretable guidelines so that they can be executed by computer programs, which is known as clinical decision support systems. So uh, this is approach that we have done for many years. Uh, actually, this approach has been well supported by the open air approaches. As we all know, there is a well known dedicated guideline definition language for open air, which is known as GDL, guideline definition language. And its second version has been published in the previous year, and an uh, open available editor was, was provided. So, by this editor, the clinical guidelines can be captured as 
a set of clinical rules with a form of when uh, conditions and then actions. And both the when and then part are associated with uh, open air, open air uh, archetypes and the templates so that the data can be directly extracted from uh, uh, EHR systems with the advanced advances of uh, open air approaches. And uh, in last year, while we were fighting for COVID-19, we have also developed another approach which directly uses open air EL based the rule editor developed by ourselves. So open, open air EL stands for expression language. So by the means of expression languages, it means the when part and then part. Both of that part are expressions such as comparisons or uh, set values for some variables. So that part can be uh, abstracted out of the GDL part, which is also a standard part of the open air approaches, open air systems. So in last year, we used this, uh, this approach to uh, develop the tool and develop a set of uh, COVID-19 guidelines and share that with our community. Uh, we both have these two experiences and this rule-based approach works fine for some guidelines. However, in some other cases, uh, this works, this approach does not work well. This is example for a stroke guideline. So different from the other guidelines that we have been edited with uh, GDL or uh, ELs, these guidelines are more represented in the form of flowcharts. Uh, so we take this flowchart example. If we want to uh, write a GDL rule, we have to uh, go through each, each uh, branches and uh, combine them together as a rule. For example, there is the, the example on your left-hand side. With the green passes, you have to really follow these passes and combine these conditions together and then make this, uh, this, this rule reasonable. And this is already not straightforward and very complex to understand. What is more troublesome is you have to write five rules for the guideline. This is really annoying because it is not straightforward for doctors and it is not very easy to uh, track back when you get the rules ready. So what we're trying to do in this time is to design and develop an easy use rule for a graphic CIG builder, which directly uses flowchart form to avoid the troubles of translating these flowcharts into rules. And this approach, we still want to make it open air based, and this kind of work has not been reported yet. So uh, first, let, allow me to uh, give some uh, introduction to our CIG building approach. So this is uh, a design approach of our, uh, our, our uh, tool. This is also the basic steps of creating CIGs based on literature. So what we wanted is to have a CIG project created at the, uh, beforehand. So in the first step, we have to create a CIG project, which contains the CIG's name, the meta info, including the author's name, the uh, basic content of this guideline, et cetera. And then in the second step, we work through this guideline. We annotate the uh, relationships and the entities of the guideline so that it is easier for the readers and for the computers to be uh, transformed. Then in the third step, based on the annotations of the entities, we develop the uh, data model for the, uh, for the guideline. And this data model have to be open air standard. So actually this is uh, templates and uh, archetypes here. And in the first step, it is drawing flowchart based on the data model created before and based on the relationships, which has been marked out in the second step. And in the fifth step, it is the test, export, and the deployment of the CIGs that has been created. There are some technical highlights that we, I want to mention because this is new in our project. So if we want to create a, a flowchart, we have to define the primitives, or let's say the elements in the flowchart first. So this is the flowchart that we have defined. And all of these primitives are actually from uh, uh, BPMN, which is uh, industry standard. And it is a state of the art flowchart formats for now. So uh, we have used uh, several uh, elements, which is mostly used for medical use. 
So the first one is a start event, which marks the start of the flow chart. And we also have the uh, end event, which marks the end of the flow chart. And then we have the data entry uh, node, which marks the acquiring data from the clinical users. The input data here, and this data can be used for uh, reference purposes in the next steps. And then we have a decision uh, node, which is used for uh, making decision rules. So you can see there are some branches, yes or no, or you can have even more uh, after this, this node. So based on these branches, doctors can make uh, decisions. And we also have a synchronized node, which is used for parallel uh, split or join. And we have some advanced uh, nodes, which are not apparent in this uh, flowchart, but they are also useful. For instance, the subprocess, which is used to wrap up the uh, complex uh, flowchart as a subprocess and embed them into a more complex flowchart to uh, make it more readable. And we have a stage uh, node, which is used to mark the end of the stage so that the structure of this flowchart can be more uh, explicit. We also have the action uh, node, which is used as the output. This for example, uh, this, this decision node is more like the when part in the rule, and the action part is more like the then part of the rule. So this is actually the output. We also have the compound node, which is a combination of several nodes together. And this node can be used as output too. We also have the explanation uh, symbol, which is used to uh, explain some parts of the, this flow chart as uh, nodes. We also have the links, which links these different nodes together as a whole flowchart. And the second part that I want to mention is the OpenL EL. So the EL, for example, is this kind of uh, expression or description. For example, this one, systolic blood pressure has been mirrored. So in this case, this uh, expression can be described as follows. So this is editor that we have created based on the uh, EL uh, semantics, but there is no uh, available editor or uh, interpreter for EL yet. So this is the tool that we have developed by ourselves in last year. So uh, we can say this EL is actually based on the open air archetypes and templates. This blood pressure is actually the archetype and also the systolic is a data item with this ID. And they have some uh, operator, for instance, this one, this, have, this means uh, exists. So this expression can be mapped back to this one uh, expression, systolic blood pressure has been mirrored. So this, these are the key techniques that we have used for our CIG builder. So in the next slides, you can see the whole design of our work. So the CIG builder can be, uh, the design can reflect to the uh, design approach that I have listed before. The first step is creating a CIG project, including the name, the structure, the meta information. And then we make guideline annotations uh, from this uh, PDF guidelines or uh, plan text guidelines. We mark up the highlighted parts and uh, differential them in different colors for different uh, uh, meanings and purposes in, in the text. And then we upload the guideline uh, to help the doctors or the guideline creators to uh, understand the content of guideline. And uh, by that, they can do the next steps, which is uh, editing the template, which can maps back to the guideline annotation. The entities that can be uh, uh, edited as a template. And then we go to the flowchart drawing part, which is drawing flowchart by the logic of this uh, guideline. And then we have a CIG test and the exportation part, which means the flowchart that comes in drawn can be tested with the data from database or input manually, and then export with standard format, which can be used by other clinical design support systems. So uh, let me give you more concrete examples. This is the first step, which is creating a CIG project, the first step. So a guideline may have several flowcharts, uh, so for each guideline, we have to create a new guideline in this part. So this symbol like lock folder is actually a guideline. And in this guideline, it has several flowcharts. There are three, for example. 
and you can create more by clicking this part. And uh, if you click there, you have two options. The first thing is to create a blank flow chart, which means you start a flow chart from scratch. It is blank and you create as you wish. And there is a second option, which is duplicate an existing flow chart because some guidelines or flow charts share a very similar structure and these guidelines or flow charts can be reused. So this is a convenient way for uh, speeding up the create, creating precise sub guideline. Uh, so uh, after you created a blank guideline or duplicate from the existing one, you can fill in this guidelines basic information, just like what you did in the uh, GDL tools or other tools. So you, you uh, enter the description of the guideline, you enter the purpose of this guideline, and you use uh, use or misuse. These are actually directly uh, borrowed from the GDL tool. And also these guidelines are updated by this part. You can update the, paper, the PDF guidelines through this part so that this paper-based or let's say the PDF guidelines can be mapped directly with uh, CIGs, which is understandable by computers. So uh, the second step is to annotate and upload this uh, paper-based guideline. So here is example for a stroke guideline. Uh, we use different colors for different uh, meanings in guideline. For instance, the yellow one means it is the entity. So this is a part of, a, of a, the vascular and the blue ones is actually a group of expression. So it uh, describes the relationship or the definition of this yellow part. And the, the, yellow, the green one is actually, it is a, a negative word. It means not exist. And also the purple one, it's the value of the, of the expression. So with these markups, it is more easy to understand for the, the uh, following steps. So after that, uh, you can do the template editing. So we have already provided the basic template here, which we uh, extracted the basic information, which are very useful for uh, clinical decision support purpose. However, in some occasions, it might, might not be enough especially for some specific disease, it may have uh, more uh, data items that has not uh, been captured yet. So here we embedded this, this template editor, which is actually reused from our HMC, which is Chinese version of CKM editor. So uh, by embedding this editor, the doctors can directly create their own templates uh, so that these data items can be added very quickly. And the next step is the flowchart editing. So in this flowchart part, uh, you can use the primitives, which is the element that I had description before. You drag these items, uh, these elements into this drawing area to draw flowcharts and link them with this link lines. And in your uh, right hand side here is the attributes of the node. So this is the uh, how it maps with the paper guideline. And also it's some uh, very basic information, for instance, the ID, the name, et cetera. So I gave several very uh, typical example of, of some nodes. Uh, the first very typical nodes is a data acquisition nodes, data entry node. So this node is using for data items, which are not available from EHRs, because for those data items that are already available from EHRs, they can be uh, extracted from HRs directly. However, some parts which are not very structured or not available, for instance, the uh, follow-up data, some it's, it is normally not available in the EHR. So we use this uh, node to capture those kind of data. And also this data is associated with a, a form which is created by our form builder. So with this uh, data form, the users can enter the data very conveniently. And still this whole process is open air based. The second important uh, uh, node is a decision node. The decision node is used to, to uh, capture the decision logic. Uh, so uh, what we need here is to enter, to select a path 
there are two paths. This path leads to a, a specific condition. So for this path, you can enter the, the conditions. You put the expression here. So what you need to do is to drag the data model from the, your left-hand side to this condition part and put the value there. So all of this information can be linked back to the uh, paper guideline. So the next step is to test the CIG step-by-step. Step. So in this step, uh, all of this CIG and here we design a test run function. By this uh, test function, you, you click the test run and the first step pops up, which is the data entry. So after enter the data, you go to the next step and the inference engine will use data to create some uh, inference results. Uh, once all of these steps are executed, you can see the uh, results of the execution. So from the left-hand side, you can see the passes that have been passed. For example, the green lines means this pass has been uh, used because the data matches this pass. And also from your right-hand side, you can see the reference uh, back to the original guideline, which is the paper, so that the users can understand which step has been executed and why. Uh, the next step is to export and disseminate the guideline uh, because this is the editing rule, uh, this is the editing environment, and we also have production uh, environment for the real uh, dissemination or real clinical use. So we have to export the, the this executable guideline as a DIP package. And this DIP package is actually a industry standard based. So we have form, which is XML or HTML format file. We have rules, which is uh, juice rules, which is industry standard. We have data model, which is of course open air. And we also have the uh, reference back to guideline, which is PDF files. So all of this information can be executed, can be interpreted by other tools. So this is uh, totally open. And the other tool can import this package and uh, interpret this, this files by uh, the industry driven uh, engines for such kind of things. So this can be executed by other system. So uh, after showing this uh, tool, we have some interesting discussion that we have found during our uh, deployment with this, uh, this system and test uh, with other uh, users. So what we assume is we start from this annotating guidelines and then they draw the flow chart, but actually people do different things. So this is what expect. People first annotate the guideline and then based on this annotated guideline, they draw flow charts, but actually they do this in uh, vice versa. The first the draw, understand guideline and draw on it, and then they go back to annotate it. So this is a little bit frustrating because uh, the flowchart cannot be uh, traced back to the text because they directly draw this flowchart without marking the guideline. Uh, however, this is understandable because in any case, you have to draw this uh, flow chart. So this uh, marking becomes natural work. So we want to change this process to make it more reasonable. So this is our uh, ongoing work. So what we wanted to do is to encourage users to mark up the guideline uh, so that uh, this whole process can be uh, more traceable. So what we are doing is to trying to make this uh, markup to this guideline conversion automatically. So what I mean is they mark up this guideline by specific tools, and then the marked up results can be transformed into this flowchart automatically without their own work of drawing this flowchart. So by doing this, they are more motivated of doing this markup work. And we also have some even further goal, which is to use NLP techniques to directly interpret this paper guideline so that this whole process can be uh, handled automatically by computers. So this work can uh, do without human, human uh, work in it. So it can be more quickly. This is specifically used for, for some guidelines, which updates very uh, 
quickly. For instance, for some uh, tumor guidelines, they update in every month. So with this approach, the guidelines can, the CIGs can update themselves. So this is possible, and we are doing some initial work already. So what we are doing is using some uh, open source uh, tools, which are originally used for NLP. They can uh, mark up the entities and relationships, and we are reducing this tool for our own purpose. So what we are doing is we uh, separated four steps to uh, use their tool to build our own uh, structured CIG. The first step is to annotate the guideline, the recommendations. And this recommendation means it is a flowchart level. And then in each recommendation, which is the flowchart level, we mark up the logic flow, which is actually the nodes in the flowchart and their sequence. And then after that has been marked up, we mark up the logic data of these items, the logic of data items. Uh, which means they are the items in the uh, flow charts. And then we ex explicit expressions to really uh, link this data with meaningful operators. So by the first step, we can create a several uh, 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 flow chart. And by the second step, we can, uh, we can uh, form the structure of this flow chart. And in the third step, we can uh, link this data items and fit them in this flow chart. And the first step, we explicit expressions to really uh, make the expression behind this discern, discern nodes meaningful. So this is work that we are working. So let me give you a quick wrap up. So what we find is OpenAir provides good technical basis for the purpose of clinical decision support. But however, uh, what has been already provided is only rule-based editors for a CIG. Sometimes the flowchart-based CIG is also very useful and meaningful. So what we are trying to do is to uh, create a flowchart-based CIG editor. So what we have done is we, create, we developed a comprehensive open air based CIG builder, which supports guideline annotation, which supports flowchart editing, and we tested this, flow, this tool with some cases, and this tool can support the guideline testing, validating, and dissemination. So, okay, this is my uh, introduction to our recent work, and now it's time for questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jen. So now it's time uh, for some questions and comments. Uh, so, uh, Professor Zhao, I have two questions. So, the first question, can BPMN represent all types of guidelines, all the contents in the guideline? The second question, what is the difference between OpenAI EL and OpenAI GDL? So, uh, thanks for Professor Zhao's question. The first one is really interesting because we have this kind of argument in this days together with Professor Liu and together with Professor Li. And uh, our uh, working conclusion is BPMN cannot capture all this control structure or information in a guideline because some guidelines are more uh, rule-based or more descriptive for that kind of guideline, maybe knowledge graph or approach is more suitable. And BPM approach is more suitable for those imperative knowledge. It means you have explicit uh, precise, you have explicit orders of the, the, uh, the operations. But for some guidelines, they are more like the teaching people how to do things and how to form their clinical thinking. For that kind of thing, the BPM approach is, is not really uh, working well. And the, the second question is about the difference of GDL and EL. So uh, what we have learned is this kind of, these two uh, languages are some kind, of, they have some overlaps. So GDL is, is uh, proposed first, and then it's proposed by Rongqian. And this language is specific for uh, clinical rules, which means you have when and then. Uh, in the when part, you have expression. And in the then part, you, you also have expression. And after some years, 
Thomas Bell has uh, created the EL language, which is more like the extraction of the expression part of the GDL. So in the EL, there's uh, originally there is no when and then. This is only an expression such as greater than or smaller than or a set the value for some uh, variables, this kind of thing. But what I found is since last year, Thomas Bell has also uh, add if and then to the EL language. So uh, in some sense, the EL becomes a super site of GDL. This is my own uh, interpretation. I will, uh, can you give us uh, some advice when we want to develop, develop uh, CDSS? Uh, how can we choose the two different languages? You, you recommend the EL or GDL? <laughs> Well, it's uh, a little bit difficult to answer. Uh, there are several things to consider. First is the tooling. Uh, GDL has their own editor and their execution engine, which is not open source, but is still open available. So uh, you can use the GDL tools directly, but for EL, well, to our best knowledge, there is only a specification and there is no uh, open available tools for that. This is a technical challenge, but we have developed our own tool and we are very pleased to share with you and with all of you. This is one thing. And uh, there's another thing is about the uh, reference mechanism. The GDL is first version supports the write algorithm, which is the typical algorithm used for uh, expert system. But in the second version of GDL, uh, Rongchen has expanded to me. Uh, in this version, it's more like the plan rules, which does not support the, uh, the Red Hat algorithm. Uh, in this sense, the reference mechanism of GDL2 is equivalent to SEL. So uh, as a conclusion, what I think is uh, OpenHR EL may have more, uh, let's say, potential because it supports the uh, more fun level of, uh, of expression of, of, of this kind of relationships, as well as the if-then logic. But GDL is more uh, comprehensive. It only supports the uh, when-then, but if you, sometimes if you only want to uh, express the expression part, it is not possible for a GDL. So as a conclusion, uh, we have choose G we have choose EL at this moment. But okay. it's only our advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so is there any question? So now, because they, uh, we already finished the uh, all the six talks. So uh, the question now is the timing is for the questions for all the uh, six presentations. So if anyone uh, still need something to discuss in this community, we, 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 we can answer ask questions for January. Hello, if anyone has some questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Heather. You have uh, inspired us all. And uh, yeah, so if it's offline, so it's timing for drink and beers, but uh, I'm sorry, so it's uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very pity that we, we, we are online. So I hope next time, uh, next summit will be offline. We can, uh, we, we can meet together and have, have beers after the report, uh, presentation. Uh, since it's almost uh, 12, 12 o'clock uh, China time, 
So we have reserved three hours of the summit. It's almost so it's almost the time, and uh, we 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 need to say goodbye to each other. And uh, thanks for everyone to join the summit. And we have very good presentation and very good discussion in this uh, summit. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's Bye -bye. great. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm.